The Spin Off Podcast Network. Love news, but find keeping up a bit overwhelming? Well, Newsable is the answer. It's your daily fix of everything worth talking about. I'm your host, Imogen Wells, and in about 15 minutes, I'll bring you what you need to know from Aotearoa and around the world and explain why it matters. Newsable tackles the big stuff without taking itself too seriously. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. You're listening to Business Is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business Is Boring is made by The Spinoff with help from Callahan Innovation. Here's your host, Simon Pound. Today's guest has broken new ground, confounded any stereotypes, and excelled at every level of business. Leaving school in South Auckland with school cert, going to be a bank teller, marrying her boyfriend and having a baby at 21, this could be the end of the public life story of many women 40 years ago. What happened instead has been a career leading some of New Zealand's biggest media companies through some of the biggest landscape changes. Joan Withers has been a CEO of one of the first to regulate radio stations, CEO of Fairfax in the last glory years of newspapers, and a professional director with 20 years of governance experience as a board member and chair. Currently chair at Mercury Energy and The Warehouse, and just recently stepping down from the chair at TVNZ, Joan has a new book out called A Woman's Place. It's a life story so far, and also practical career advice, stories from the front line, and thoughts on that provocative title, A Woman's Place. Hey, um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, first up, can we look at how you built this career? Tell me about getting your start in media uh, once you'd had a few years at home with your child. Oh, well, thank you, Simon. Um, the career was not so much built as the career happened. And uh, before my son was born, I'd started a, a journalist cadetship out in South Auckland, which I hadn't completed. So uh, what I did when I decided I wanted to go back to work was uh, go and knock on doors rather than answering advertisements. So I went to the local paper and said, do you have any vacancies for cadet journalists? And they said, well, no, but if you want to sell advertising features, you can write the advertorial in the middle. And I needed to only work part-time and have all school holidays off. So that's how I started. And, uh, yeah, I was reasonably successful, enjoyed the work enormously, and then kept getting offered promotions. How did you get those promotions? I mean, that seems really interesting to be that open to the opportunity of doing something that involved some advertising selling in there as well. I think the thing about advertising sales is that it is eminently accountable. You tally up what you've done every week, so it's very measurable, and I did do well. And so I was offered the opportunity to go out to Papakura and run the branch office for the newspaper out there, and supervise a number of staff who were based there. So that was sort of the first extension. And from there I became sales manager and then through more senior managerial roles, effectively within the same organisation. So it's just doing the job to the best of your ability. And if you do it well, then people are going to keep giving you chances. What are the kind of things that allow you to get those promotions? I mean, um, is it is it ownership, like really owning your responsibilities? Is it delivering? It's both. You have to own your responsibilities and ultimately you have to deliver. You have to be able to do the job. Nobody's going to promote you if you're a failure in the job you're already in unless the new job is a totally different direction. So 
it's success breeds success, I guess. And you mentioned in the book about how you were feeling at a certain point uh, after a few promotions and as you kind of were getting into the corporate ladder, uh, a lack of those qualifications. And so you went back to do the MBA. T- tell me about like what that was like and, and, and how it worked for you. It was really interesting because the lack of tertiary qualifications really weighed quite heavily as I went through the ranks. And it was internal more than external. But coincidentally, that was about the era where MBA started to gain some real credibility and Auckland University were doing them. So I had a look at the course content and it was absolutely directly relevant to what I was doing in my roles. So I didn't think I'd be able to be accepted because I didn't have university entrance. We were putting our son through private schooling at that stage, so we didn't really have the spare money capacity to uh, to fund the course, and I knew I'd have to get a lot of indulgence from my employer. But sort of magically, all of the hurdles fell away, so my employer effectively paid the course fees, gave me the time off I needed for lectures, and my family tucked in behind and, and helped at home. That family helping at home thing comes really through in the book where uh, your, your son was doing the shopping on the weekends and you were up at 3am doing the reading for the courses. And that's kind of two years of massive commitment. It was hell on earth in terms of the workload, but I just loved being at university. So it was far more onerous for everyone around me than it was for me because I was immersed in this stuff. I just loved it. And as I said, I, you know, I didn't anticipate I'd ever be able to go and get a degree, and this is a master's degree, so I was absolutely committed to doing it well. And uh, so it was, I knew once I'd started, I just had to keep going because the worst thing would be to, to fall out you know, a third of the way or halfway through the course and end up with nothing after you've invested all that time and energy. Tell me about the upskilling that goes on there. Uh, as um, w- what was it, the last paper that you did ended up becoming the blueprint for your next job? Well, that was the thing. Uh, As part of the executive MBA, you have to do what is effectively a mini thesis. And so at some stage in the second year, I became very conscious that the fate of afternoon newspapers, and at that stage I was working at the Auckland Star, was pretty dire. And I, as I said in the book, I really wanted to start testing these theories in real life. So I made the decision to look for another job and luckily for me, the role at Radio I, which was called Chief Executive, but it was very small, it was 35 people in the company, uh, was available and, and I, was, uh, I was appointed. So I based my mini thesis uh, on the repositioning of a radio station in a deregulated market in Auckland. And just before that, you, you, you did make that jump, uh, t- tell me about the environment at the start because uh, you were caught up right in the middle of some massive media changes there with the profitability leaking away and, and afternoon newspapers not really being viable. And that was that your first kind of big experience of having to uh, run restructuring and let people go? Yes, it was. And that was particularly tough uh, in the march before I left. Uh, I got a call while I was up actually at the university doing a lecture and and somebody came to me and said, you've had a message, Uh, you must call before you go back to the office. So I made the call and the then uh, managing director of INL, Mike Robson, uh, has said to me, don't go to the building, go to the building across the road. So I arrived there and he told me that there was massive restructuring planned. At that stage I was marketing manager, so in charge of all marketing and sales. Um, I think the general manager and the deputy general manager were both going and I effectively had to reduce the headcount within my own area significantly with only 48 hours notice. So I knew that the normal routine was that it's uh, last in, first out. I knew if that was the case, we didn't have any hope of survival because the best reps had been appointed most recently. So I went to the union official Uh, and talked to her and uh, got her on side so she and I developed the the list and the great irony was that because the INL redundancy package was pretty damn generous was the people who were staying as we went round to inform them that were bursting into tears (laughs) 
they'd already set their sights on on funding overseas travel or extensions to their house or whatever on the redundancy money. So very interesting and a very big learning. Yeah, huge changes in in media there. And so jumping out of the um, de- declining afternoon newspapers and then into newly deregulated radio. What was that like, kind of making up the the rules or, or making new ground there? Well, it was fabulous, in a word. And the culture between newspapers and, and radio is very, very different. And I went back into newspapers in Fairfax. Radio is far more seat of the pants, crazy. Um, there's nowhere near the, so, the, the same sort of deference for someone in a senior role in radio. Mm. And I had no radio experience, but I was incredibly lucky in that there was a phenomenal program director who said to me when I walked in the door, well, you know nothing about radio. I know nothing about business. Let's work this out together. Mm. And then we hired some brilliant people and uh, we had a great marketing manager. And I think it was a combination of the three of us and the absolute thing that I'd learnt in MBA is you've got to differentiate yourself. And in radio, the only real sustainable differentiator is the talent, mm. as we're still seeing today. So we changed the lineup and um, put Kerry Smith on breakfast and got Pete Sinclair in doing Love Songs Till Midnight. Mm. And the thing was a phenomenon. We rebranded it, called it I 98 FM, targeted it at females. 25 to 54, which of course is a very lucrative advertising audience, and away we went. That's such a cool environment to be in. What is it about the media companies that's attracted you? Because you've worked across a bunch of media companies over your career. I think media does get into your blood, and there is a certain excitement. It's very important what you're doing. If you're working in newspapers, obviously it's really important newspapers was very deadline driven in those days obviously there was no such thing as the internet back then so it was a once in 24 hour cycle if you're working for a for a daily paper and so certain urgency certain realization that you can't afford to make mistakes or that mistakes become very obvious very quickly uh, and just people who are in the same mode really enjoy what they're doing when you made the move from sales which is very numbers uh driven uh, to be responsible for marketing as well. What were the skills you needed to pull out of that MBA to then be able to move into uh, top executive roles? Like, what, what what is it that people on the marketing side need to add to their repertoire to be able to succeed in those top roles? The numbers always count, and the higher up the organisation you go, financial literacy is really, really important. And the things that I learned in MBA, I still use every day. So for much of the course, it was like a light going on. Obviously, the marketing paper, you know, I was across that sort of stuff. I'd lived and breathed that. But it's things like financial management, where for the first time, I understood how to analyse a business case, what discounted cash flows meant, uh, and the importance of getting those things right when you're assessing a project or an investment. So... uh, That was probably the main thing. The HR areas, obviously, you learn that as you go along, although it was great to have have some discipline around that and theory around that. Legal studies was interesting. So as I said, the course was highly relevant to what I was doing and just enhanced the skills that I'd learnt on the job. So moving from radio, where you took that one of the first stations and took it to number one, and then into, um, should we jump to, to Fairfax and... You know, that must have been pretty exciting, the last glory years of um, of newspapers. You know, incredibly um, prominent in the landscape. You know, everyone lived on what the next day's front page was going to be, advertising coming in. What was it like? Well, it was amazing. And I'd been on the board of Fairfax in Australia. I was actually doing governance at that stage. And uh, the succession plan that they thought would work for the New Zealand business hadn't hadn't panned out. So I was offered the opportunity to go in as CEO. And initially I was going to go in, for th- I sort of signed a three-year contract, but I mean, when David Kirk arrived, I, that was extended and I, I spent four years in that role. And yes, it was. Um, revenues for, for newspapers were still growing at that stage. Every year I was there, we grew market share against the competition. Uh, and yes, it's incredibly important. We did, you know, I'm very proud of the journalistic record of the newspapers in the Fairfax stable, and we had magazines as well and suburban newspapers. So um, hugely exciting period, and I loved that. But it was obvious 
you're starting to see with GFC 2008, I was there between 2005 and 2009, you could see it was newspapers that were being most adversely affected in terms of the media landscape in New Zealand. And of course, since then, ad revenues for newspapers have have literally fallen off, off a cliff. But the thing I think that was most important that we could see was the digital environment. So we own stuff. While I was there, David drove the initiative. David Kirk was group CEO, and we bought Trade Me. Mm-hmm. So it was a situation where the business looked at what the cash cows were and used that as an investment, spent $750 million buying Trade Me to make sure that the business was equipped into the future. And uh, equipping journalists to work across multi-platforms was also fascinating and challenging. I remember the talk about that uh, the, the purchase of trade me as being a crazy price but uh, as a I was a young reporter and when you realized that the actual entire business model of newspapers was to sell classified advertising and everything else all the big ads all the news was kind of frippery on the top of of classified advertising and trade me was the future of classified advertising I think people will look back on that as one of the brightest media moves uh, in the country Yeah, and it was just living to the thing you also learn in MBA, which is diversify your portfolio. So, yeah, the rivers of gold were disappearing quickly. They'd actually started going before that in terms of things like trade and exchange in New Zealand. Uh, But, yeah, employment was a massive category for newspapers, and very quickly Trade Me had uh, got a very good holding in that area and real estate, of course. So, yes... But having both within the stable was was very good. And obviously, then we're starting to see the fledgling revenues coming into display advertising on the stuff side as well. Tell me about what a good day as a CEO uh, at somewhere like Fairfax looks like. You know, um, whenever I talk to people in those roles, their days seem to start at 5 a.m. and finish at 10 p.m. No, I never did that sort of regime. I did start early because that's my body clock and because I've had a commute in from, in from South Auckland. I used to start early, but I'd normally get away about 6 o'clock at night. So it is busy. But the thing I learned being a CEO is it's actually the things that you enjoy doing that are the most important. And again, that, it's, a big, it's a big category, but talent management, talking to people, getting the right people around you. In radio, that was critically important, but in, in newspapers, it's important as well. Sitting there and writing your board report is important, but actually it doesn't move the dial. Mm. So there's a, in any job there's dross. You've just got to work out what are the things that are actually going to make a difference and make sure that you spend enough time on those things. Tell me about delegation. Uh, in the book a couple of times it's mentioned about the teams that you built around you. Uh, the Tight Five was um, the name of one of those groups. How do you manage to... Um, give people enough responsibility and ownership that they do a good job, but not so much that things happen that you don't know but then end up being your problem? I think it's all about communication. If you get great people, you know what you know what their ability is. And actually, it's lovely to be able to delegate stuff because as a CEO, you certainly can't do it all. And if you try to do that, you're going to fail. So the people I got around me were eminently capable in the roles they fulfilled. But what we did do is, and David, I'd sort of not thought about the Type 5. David had mentioned that in the in the forward. Um, we communicated on a very regular basis and had brief meetings, but meetings that covered all the points. So we all knew what everyone was doing, and I think that's the secret. And is that done in kind of like a daily stand-up or... What, what kind yeah, of, yeah, just well, at least a couple of times a week getting together. We used to call them WIPs meetings and just go in and catch up on, with what was happening. And then the individual conversations that you have with your direct report so you get a sense of what their challenges are and they're opening up about, about issues they're finding and, and hopefully you're able to assist them in, in meeting their objectives as well. D- d- tell me a little bit about the um, the role of a CEO. I, I kind of, as, as I've spent more time in, in big corporate structures uh it it seems really interesting that the ceo is this kind of fulcrum where all of the pressure of the organization underneath comes up to them and then all the pressure of the board and the capital come down on them and it's just them in the middle yeah well it does feel like that on some days and i think the great thing for me personally now is having been a ceo myself i i know it helps me being a chair and 
forging the relationship that I need to have with the CEOs that, that I'm working with. So it is like that, but it's the point I made before, if you're a CEO and you've got a great team around you and you are really aligned and you're focused on the same objectives, then there's nothing that's more fun in the world. And it's actually a good CEO will understand the skills and competencies that he or she has around the board table as well. So in an ideal environment, you, you're actually eliciting the wisdom from, from the directors that uh, you've got who effectively you're reporting to. So I won't say that it's easy, it's not, but certainly if, if it's functional, if it's not dysfunctional, it, um, you can learn from both perspectives, from the people you report to and the people you've got reporting into you. Let's look at that governance situation there. What led you to jump into governance? Because you did that while, um, before your Fairfax stint as CEO. Yeah, when I was... Um, so after Radio I, I was headhunted into what was Radio New Zealand at that stage and uh, I was running a subsidiary part of the business and then I was promoted to um, run the, well, be COO of the commercial operations. And the Crown then decided they were going to privatise the commercial radio arm. So um, Nigel Milan, who I was reporting to, left to go and work in Australia and I was appointed to the CEO so um, I took it through the privatisation process, which I found enormously rewarding and stayed with the new owners for just under two years. But in, as part of that sale process, I'd been exposed a lot to the board uh, and I'd been exposed to Treasury and I knew that there was a momentum, a push to get more women on boards even back then. So um, it was coincidental with us deciding we wanted a rural lifestyle, so I thought rather than working 60 hours a week as a CEO, might be good to go into governance. So that's what I did, and it was, um, yeah, a very big transition. What does it take to be a good board member, contributor to a board? The bedrock things are honesty and integrity and professionalism and an absolute commitment to do the work that's required. You have to be bright enough to um, absorb a lot of information and retain a lot of information. I believe you have to be pretty pretty financially uh, numerate. You have to be able to work with other people and be have enough EQ to understand when you should speak up and when you should shut up. Uh, never put people down I think one of the challenges is just for directors to understand when they're asking questions of the CEO or, or his or her management team the way they phrase those questions so that they don't sound like they're a criticism but they're actually truly eliciting information you've got to have the time and the capacity to dedicate to board roles um, I mentioned a moment ago investors are looking at that very seriously now and you might be able to cope with your diary, but if things go wrong in an organisation, then there's a hell of a lot more involvement required. Um, and I think you've got to keep learning. And uh, with disruption and what's happening at the moment, uh, one of the challenges for boards, I think, is, is dealing with the rate of change within organisations and whether getting together on a monthly basis, and the chair is obviously much more in touch with the business than that, but is that model fit for purpose when businesses are going through the level of disruption that they are at the moment? McKinsey says that the greatest organisational competency that, that you have to have now is clock speed. So you've got to try and find a way to be able to fulfil your fiduciary, your legal and regulatory responsibilities, but also support the management team as they need it. That idea of responsibility, it just keeps getting broader as well, doesn't it, for yep. uh, for, for board members and, and directors with the new health and safety responsibilities and also with uh, legal and, and, and uh, responsibilities to sh shareholder value. What do people need to learn before getting into boards and how do people find out kind of what those responsibilities are? Well, anyone wanting to be a director, a professional director, should go and do the IOD or, or the even the Australian Institute of Directors courses because that's a good foundation to have. And then do a hell of a lot of due diligence about the organisation they're planning to go into or if they've been offered a seat on the board, do that due diligence very carefully. 
And I make the point to younger directors coming in to be really careful if they're going into smaller organisations. When you're at my stage and you're on predominantly big boards, um, you, you, there's a lot of resource that's there in situ. You've got a great CFO and finance team. You've got a great CEO. You've got advisors up the yin-yang to come and you know, talk to you about whether or not you're going to breach disclosure with a certain thing happening. In small organisations, that resource is frequently not there. Health and safety, obviously that's been an evolution with a change of legislation a couple of years ago, so we're all learning and we're all being very rigorous in terms of our due diligence around health and safety in our organisations. So yes, it's not something to step into lightly and as I tell everyone, things can go wrong and sometimes they do. Yeah, t- tell me about the... Um the experience you had with you know, a very long career of amazing success and then one of the companies, Feltex, that you came into after the, the float, um, founded. And uh, what, what was that like to be caught up in a company that, that didn't go right? No, I joined the board just before the float. Mm-hmm. So I'd been part of the Auckland Airport float. In fact, Auckland Airport was one of the first boards I sat on and the Crown sold down at shareholding. Um, very soon, about 12 or 18 months after I joined that board. So I'd been through a successful float, joined the Feltex board just before the IPO. Uh, With any float, there are uh, prospective financial information statistics put out there, and that's part of, of what people look at when they're planning to invest. And if you don't meet those forecasts, then obviously there are repercussions. And Feltex didn't make its forecasts. So I left the business before it actually did collapse but was obviously part of of what happened uh, when the profit downgrade was announced. So that's still going through the courts 10 or 11 years later. So the point I make in the book, though, is about the personal impact that that has on your life when something like that happens because you're devastated that shareholders have lost value and... uh, in spite of the fact everything was done at best practice level and everybody operated with integrity and ethics and you know applied themselves uh, diligently to the roles, that still can go wrong. And uh, the, personal, the personal effect is, is very profound. I mean, what's it like to wake up and see yourself on the front page of the paper or you know, men- mentioned in the paper or on the news or have things personalised like that? Well, it was shocking. And it was just every day. It felt relentless. And the trouble is, when you're in that situation, you think you're the, you know, you're the centre of the universe, and everyone's looking at this, and it's it's all bad. Um, so, without my husband, I don't know whether I would have um, retained my sanity. I think it's it's very very hard. What lessons do you take from that, and then bring to the other board work that you've done? The only lesson that I can take out of it is things do go wrong. So you have to be prepared in that in that scenario to be able to cope with it. You very you you know you do the same things, but you're able if somebody does have a different point of view, you're able to reinforce how important it is to do things correctly. In terms of diversity, which is a really big theme of uh, the book and, and and your work, we've gone backwards. It's remarkable, you know. I mean. Uh, one female CEO out of the NZX 50, uh, 13% of board directors being female. I mean, that's that's absolutely bananas that it's going backwards when we have more women and more diversity across the mid ranks and the high ranks of companies, but less at the top now than five years ago. What's going on? Well, it's disappointing. Actually, the directorship number is moving upwards, but very, very slowly. Having only Kate McKenzie on the CEO list for the NZX Top 50 is extremely disappointing. And yes, we have been better in that regard. But because there are more women coming through the pipeline now, I remain optimistic that those numbers are going to change. And there are a lot of us working hard on a number of initiatives to try and improve that more quickly. So global women are running breakthrough leaders courses to help women in the pipeline reach their full potential. They have the Champions for Change initiative, which is a whole bunch of men and women who are working on the practical aspects of improving diversity. You've got the Future Directors Scheme, whereby... A young person sits around a board table with a 
group of experienced directors and learns about governance firsthand. Often that's a woman, so you know, hopefully that will improve the stats because they come out of that process board ready. We're mentoring. We're trying to find out. Lots of organisations are trying to work out why some women are actually getting to a certain level and then opting out, and that's interesting. And I think the bigger companies in New Zealand are pretty universally looking at ways that they can dial in flexibility to make it easier for women who don't want to have to make too many compromises in terms of their family situation, help them to stay the distance. In terms of getting the diversity happening, you know, it's been said that if CEO pay was linked to uh, gender diversity, it would happen overnight. And is there also a case to be made for boards? You know, if board... Um, uh, remuneration packages were linked to having female CEOs. Would that would that change overnight? I mean, what it, what's the blocker? I'd be very disappointed if that happened. Um, I fundamentally believe the CEOs I work with are doing everything in their power to make sure they do get diverse teams around them, and not only diverse in terms of gender, but a, across the whole spectrum. I'm totally opposed to quotas because I think that would drive uh, pursuit just for the attainment of a metric as opposed to what we're doing at the moment is just making sure we're going as far and wide as we possibly can to find the people, the diverse people, who are eminently qualified to fulfil these roles. And they are out there. But the recruiters, you know, have to be chastised on a regular basis because some of them still come back with the same old, same old list. So I had to fire one recruitment agency some time ago when I was looking for a marketing-oriented director and they came back with a long list that did not include one female. Now, there might be some slight excuse if it was something like engineering, although there are great engineering women out there. But it just reinforced the fact to me that they... The research has to has to happen, and then you find amazing candidates for these jobs. Is there quite a bit of inherent sexism still there? And I I take the example of your promotion of the book, where there's been a number of interviews that you've done, and people have asked you about the clothes you wear and uh, your appearance. And I can never remember, with the maybe the exception of like Rob Fife or Mark Weldon, ever male directors or prominent business people being talked about in terms of appearance. And it seems, you know, it seems so nuts that those would be the questions that are being asked of you today with your career and this book and its purpose. Uh, you, has the environment got less sexist? Is it still that sexist? It is a hell of a lot less sexist than it was 20 years ago. And often the comments that were made back then were well-intentioned but out of line. And I think, you know, I, I recount in the book some of the situations where comments have been made by men and there's been a massive lashback. T tell us a little bit about those initiatives to get people into the boardroom. I love that idea of people coming along and sitting in on meetings. And when you say a young person, what age are you talking about there? Like, if someone's sitting listening to this podcast and they're, they're under 40 and they've got a little bit of... Uh, senior leadership experience in a corporate, should they be putting their hand up? Or do you have to wait until you're in the uh, the C-suite, you're some kind of uh, executive there? W when do you start in order to get that pipeline happening? Well, I think if, you, you're in a, if you're in a reasonably senior role, typically the future directors are sort of level two or level three. Um, but the, it's a great scheme, and the IOD, it was Stephen, Stephen uh, Tyndall, Michael Stiasny, Michael Stiasny and Des Hunt who set the scheme up, and lots of companies are now picking it up. So it's quite formal in that, obviously, these people have to sign non-disclosure agreements because they're hearing confidential information. They normally have a, a stint of either 12 to 18 months, they attend every board meeting and they can attend committee meetings. They take part in all of the discussion and the debate. They don't take part in, in decision making. And there are quite you know, strict legal protocols around what they can and can't do so that they don't ever become deemed directors. But it works. And uh, anybody, it's, it's harder to find people who've got skills in the marketing area, as one example, so or in digital technology area. So... Anybody interested should just go and, and contact IOD and put their hand up for um, for taking a position. 
And if there's one thing that I kind of got from the book, it is that idea that you're, you're, you're showing that you can do as long as you keep learning and work hard, you can do anything. You can, but there's no silver bullet. You've got to do the hard work and you've got to have the skills and experience that are required for any particular job. So my, my thing is always telling people to differentiate themselves by taking control of their own training program. Take everything your employer gives you and be grateful for it. That's fantastic. But actually look at where you want to go and start supplementing what you've got with what you will need. And it's so easy now via the internet or going to short courses at the university to do that. Thank you very much for joining us to talk today about your new book, A Woman's Place. That's Joan Withers. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Simon. Thank you to Madeline Chapman for producing. And thank you for listening. You've been listening to Business is Boring, presented by Simon Pound. And brought to you by The Spin-Off and Callahan Innovation. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring. Brought to you by SparkLab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on SparkLab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.